now we're ready to move on to the projection transform. So this is the next step in the process. We've got from world coordinates, we, we already got into view coordinates with our camera looking down the negative z-axis. And now we want to do something uh, which is going to allow us to get this perspective effect. And it's going to get us into a clip coordinate space. So what is this projection transform? So we have some choices. So we can use an orthographic or a parallel projection where the rays from the camera are parallel. This is what you have so far. Or we can have a perspective um, and we could have a wider perspective or a narrower perspective. So there's a couple of different things we could choose for our projection transform. Here's some examples of what these things look like. So, so far we had an orthographic pro projection. Things that get further away aren't getting any smaller. And a perspective projection, things that get further away do get smaller. Uh, and then here's just a rendering of some objects so you can see the difference. You've probably noticed this when you were looking at your blocky animal. Something seems a little bit funny. We're used to looking at the world with a perspective projection. That's what our eyes do. So when we, we get rotations of objects on the screen that are happening only with orthographic, there's something that looks a little funny to, to most people about it. And this is what we've had so, so far. So in orthographic, what do we have? The rays coming towards the projection plane or the screen plane are all coming in parallel. So our matrix, uh, it's written funny here with one line dropped out because we don't care about Z. Um, it's just an identity matrix. We essentially just throw away Z, right? So that's why we haven't written this. So our XYZ with a homogeneous W coordinate gets passed through. We get XY, XY is what goes on the screen. So this is orthographic. That's what we have. Seems simple to understand. This matrix is just get, get rid of a component. Um, in general, it's a little bit more complicated. This matrix could have other stuff in it because there's a left, right, bottom, top, near, far. Uh, we're going to come back to what all of these things are when we talk about the new perspective. But I just wanted you to know there is a command which sets up a more general orthographic projection matrix. And, and you can call this command to set things up. And if you call this command with these left and right, bottom, top, near, far set to what they are right now, you're going to get an identity matrix because your projection matrix so far, since we're not setting it, is essentially identity. We're not doing it. So let's take a look at what's going on with perspective. Perspective is a little bit more interesting. And we're finally going to find out why do we need this last row of our four by four matrices. So we have some point uh, in three dimensional space, x, y, z. And we're going to have a 1 because we're in homogeneous space. So this 3D H says that we're in homogeneous space. And this is going to get projected down towards the origin, because remember our camera is on the origin. We already did that in our viewing transform. So then our projection, we can assume this to be true. Our camera is on the origin. We're looking, um, oops. So this is, um, this is along the Z direction, right? It should be the negative Z. Uh, and we want to know where does this point land on our viewing plane? And so here's a matrix that does that. We see we now have a component down here. We, we can look at this in a little more detail to, to see what's going on. Um, we'll look first at the math. So in orthographic, let's talk about orthographic because we already did it. We have XYZ. We multiply it times this identity matrix. We get XYZ. We just look at XY. Everything's the same size. Now we have this extra one up here in the perspective matrix. So when we multiply our XYZW times this matrix, what we get is XYZZ, right? Because this this component right here. This W is probably a one, right? This, this puts a Z here. And remember I told you the final screen space coordinates are X, Y divided by W. There's a W divided here. So now we have to divide by the Z. So now we end up with our final spot on the screen is X divided by Z and Y divided by Z. So objects are gonna shrink as they get further away. This is something we didn't have with orthographic. So this going up a dimension, not only did it help us to get translation by adding some components over here in this part of the matrix, this bottom row, we're able to stick a component here and together with the perspective divide, play this game of getting perspective to work out right. So this is a second reason that we've gone up a dimension when we specify our matrices and graphics. And four by four matrices are the standard. We've been using them so far, and they're used also for setting up the viewing. Okay. So, so this is the simplified version of this. So what does this look like? We have our camera. We're looking down our negative Z. We're going to have something called the view frustum. So a frustum is, is a pyramid, right? Um, and it's going to be cut off on a near plane and a far plane. And everything that's inside this gray boundary is what's going to render. 
Now, what you've had previously is an orthographic centered around the origin of a little box, which is what's going to render. And sometimes your objects have fallen out of that box and you don't see them anymore. That will be true here. So there's some region out here where things are going to, to render. And we want to set this up to be in this way. So what are the different components of setting this thing up? I think we can just go ahead. Let me see where are we are. Ah, OK. I have to talk a little bit more about what, what's going on with this. So here's our view frustum. So what is it doing? It's taking our projection transform, is going to attempt to take everything in this space inside this frustum and put it inside a canonical negative one to one box around the origin. Okay, so this is what you've had so far. You've, you've had all your objects have to fall in this negative one to one. Um, but we haven't been taking them from someplace else and bringing them in, and we haven't been applying this projection transform onto them. So the matrix that we put there for the perspective projection is going to be the matrix which takes this and puts your objects into this uh, clip space, negative one to one around the origin. So here's a matrix that does that. You don't need to know. There's going to be a command that's going to make this matrix for you. It doesn't really make any difference. How, where, where does it come from? Um, I'm introducing it here just so you can see something about this idea. But the important thing is I've got a component down here. Now, is it one or negative one down in the bottom? It switched from the previous matrix. How come? Well, it depends if we're looking on plus Z or negative Z. And the first diagram was using plus Z to make the math easy. But in a real situation, we're looking down negative Z. So there's a negative one here. There's an alternate interpretation. So here's what I've said so far. We take things inside the view frustum. And then we squish this thing to turn into this box, negative one to one around the origin. And that's what our matrix is supposed to be doing. Another interpretation is we're going to take our world and we're going to transform the objects. Because remember, there's always a duality between changing our coordinate space and changing the objects. So in the same way our matrix can do a rotator or translator scale, our matrix can do this crazy projection thing on cubes. So you could, instead of saying we have a perspective matrix, you could say, I applied a transform to my cube such that the front side of the cube got bigger and the back side of the cube got smaller. Well, that's the same thing as a perspective uh, projection, right? Things in the back got smaller, things in the front. So did we transform our cube or did we transform our space? Just as with everything else, it's not very clear which one are we talking about. Almost everybody talks about it this way, too. This is uh, intellectually interesting, but it's not the way that we typically think about it in graphics. So what are we going to call to actually get this done? We're going to use a call times pers called perspective. In original GL, this was called GL utility library perspective. So whenever it was GLU, this is utility. It wasn't part of the built-in uh, GL. We'll see the more basic command in a little while. But the perspective command is easier to understand, the one you're probably using. So what are our parameters? We have a field of view. And it uses the field of view Y. So this is an angle uh, of how much we, we want to see the world. We have an aspect parameter. Uh, this basically says, is our screen square or is our screen rectangular? And then we have the near and the far plane. And we do have to specify these near and far planes. And they're the distance from our camera location to the front and rear of the thrust of. So let's take a look at some example of what's going on. So here's the field of view. So I'm changing the field of view. As the field of view gets bigger, the object gets smaller, right? Because we're seeing more of the world. More of the, the world. So I, I think this should be relatively intuitive. Here's aspect ratio. So you normally want to set this to be the same as your window. Right, so here I'm changing aspect. Can you see my object is stretching and squeezing? Well, we normally don't want to do that. We want everything to be nice and square. But since I have a square window, the aspect should be one. But if, in fact, I had a rectangular window, then I would set this aspect to something else to match the window. Here's changing the near plane. And so some of you encountered this effect already. So I can move my near plane back. I can't get all the way to the camera. Zero is not allowed. 0.001 is allowed. But zero is not. And as I move forward, if I cross my object, my object gets clipped out. Is it because it after it's transformed, it falls out of that clipping space. It's not in negative one to one. 
So here's the same thing for ZFAR. As I come in from the back, I can clip away the object from the back. Um, you shouldn't specify ZFAR to be in front of ZNear. That doesn't make sense. Um, and you can set it as far away as you want, but it needs to be, you can't set infinite. You have to set some finite value that's going to be on ZFAR. So this is what you set up to set perspective. In your code, you're probably going to set this once. You probably don't need to change this unless you wanted to give the user animated control over their camera. So a lot of games you may have played may give you control over the field of view, and you may want to put that into your world where the user can control that. Um, most of the time, you wouldn't necessarily be changing these things in the middle of things running. So here's an example from some game. So here's field of view 30 degrees, 60 degrees, up to 175 degrees. You don't normally set a really wide field of view like this. Um, what's the field of view you should set? Well, the way to think about this is look where your head is next to the monitor you're looking at right now, right? This is real world trigonometry. Your, your, your real eye on your, on your head is located in some location. Your screen has some size. So what's the field of view? What's the angle that that screen represents from where you're at, right? So you know your distance to the screen, you know the size of the screen, you do a little trigonometry, you figure this out. For most of you, that number is actually pretty small. It's not really wide angle, like 120 degrees. It's more like 15 degrees or 30 degrees, depending on where you're sitting, relative to the screen that you're looking at. Um, we don't normally sit close enough that even 60 uh, would be a sensible setting. Now, why do people set wider? Well, because you're playing your game and you want to see the other guy so that you can win your game. So people set it wide. But if you want your graphics to look right to your eye, you typically would set something more narrow. So I want to show a couple of things that come into play. Um, so we've talked about these near and far planes. And, and D, we can clip our object, right? So if I don't set my near clipping plane right, so here this, this bunny was in a renderer. And I'm going to show, I'm going to step back and forth so you can see. So here I'm rotating the bunny. Um, and, I, and the clipping plane is not updating. So when I turn the head of the bunny, it crosses the clip plane, and part of it gets cut away. So this is an effect you can see, and you may see it as you write your programs. So what can I do to fix this? Well, I could set my near plane to 0 0.001, but there's going to be another problem that comes along with that, and we're going to see an example of that in a, in a minute. So here's an example from Minecraft. So I'm standing uh, inside the villager, right? So this is part of the villager's head. Here's the, here's the cut plane, and this is you're seeing the inside of the villager's head. And why am I standing in this ridiculous location? Because I want to show near plane clipping, right? Happens in real programs, not just when you have a bug, because you have to set something for your near plane. Uh, and so when you get close enough, it's going to happen. And then I also want to show this effect in here called Z fighting. So here we see this, this weird striping effect. This is not part of the texture applied to this villager. Um, this is two polygons that are very close to each other. And you're basically getting randomly one in front of the other. So I have, a, I have a couple of examples here. So as I move around, you can see that this flashes, right? So the, the clipping plane behaves with this small motion. The clipping plane doesn't change much. But the Z fighting, I basically get random colors in this location as, as I change back and forth. So what's going on with this Z fighting? Why, why, is, why am I getting this effect? What's happening? So the reason this happens and this is also the reason we need to set the near and far planes, is because our precision is not uniform in our space. We have some precision, floating point precision, that we're going to store in our, in our depth buffer, right? So somewhere inside the program, we're saying the current Z value of the current pixel is set to 2.5. And then you come and render another object, and it's at 2.51. And the question is, is that too close? Is that within my floating point precision or not? Depends on how many bits you have, depends on a variety of things. But it turns out we have more precision up close. We have less precision up far. There's a, there's a relationship like this in the space. And so what's happening in Z fighting is we don't have high precision. So I render an object, and then I render another one that's supposed to go behind, but they fell inside the same bucket because of this floating point precision. And whenever they fall inside the same bucket, we essentially get randomly whichever one is going to be in front. So here's another example of the Z fighting. Um, it's hard to see here, but it's this edge, instead of being a nice clean edge, has a little bit of jump up and down. I think it's easier to see in, in the other example. 
So what was the settings in these two cases? So here I had some limited range, right, from 0.1 to 1,000 for my near and far planes. Here I've set a really tiny near plane and a really far, far plane, and I've been able to and it introduces this effect. I, I didn't make this up, so this one I, that I didn't do. But um, when you change the, the amount, then you can introduce this. So now why don't we just set our near plane to 0.001 so that we don't have near plane clipping because we're going to get the Z fighting effect. Why don't we just set it to really close to our object because then we risk our, our clipping planes. So we have to set some reasonable thing. I think in your program, you can set something like 0.1 and 1,000 and everything's probably going to behave correctly for you. For you. Okay, so we've talked about perspective, but now there's this more general frustum. And if, indeed, GL would know you. The GL command frustum, what used to be a built in command, generates some other matrix, and you have to specify left, right, bottom, top, near, far. Now, why would you want to do it this way? What would be the value? Right? So, this is talking about doing this. Here, I'm just adjusting the right plane. This is again an animated animated GIF, GIF that's, that's playing. So I'm adjusting one side of this and I'm and I have the camera is not changing. The at point is not changing. What I'm changing here is the frustum around this. Um, and you can in fact cross over the symmetry line and have a really small frustum that's pointed in a non-symmetric way. Would you ever want to do this? So we can generate this matrix and it was the built-in thing, although we usually want a symmetric matrix. Why? Why? So it turns out there are some special cases where you would want to do this. And they even sell real world cameras to let you do this. These are called view cameras. And the optical axis of this lens is not straight back at the projection plane. So in a camera, the pixel array is the projection plane. Here's a lens that's bending in some weird way. And this kind of camera was used often by architects taking pictures of buildings. So if you just stand and take a picture of a building, your lines recede away like this. And if you're a highly paid architect and the city just paid you $10 million to design their building, um, you don't want to show them pictures that look like this. So what could you do? You could point your camera at the horizon. And now I would get nice square lines that show my building in a nice square shape. And, um, but then I would have a lot of ground. So instead, I could buy this fancy lens. And then I could have take pictures where I have a nice square shape. And I don't have this extra ground. So, in real cameras, this was a reason that people would change their frustum to not be centered around the optical axis. Now, you can do all of this stuff in Photoshop today, but if we we're on film, then we had to use them to do this. So what's a more modern use where we might want to set some other kind of frustum? So a more modern reason that we might want to do this is that um, we want to make 3D, right? So here's, these are just cheapo 3D cameras. But uh, imagine that we want to render for a 3D system, an Oculus or something like this, where we have different views. So, or a, a 3D TV or 3D movie theater. So the way those work is the left and right eyes have slightly different views. And so we have to render twice. We render for the left eye, we render for the right eye. If we just set a single at point and we render from each eye, the two planes will not coincide with each other. And it produces a slightly weird effect when you look at it. It's not quite what you want. What you really want is I have a projection screen. You can think of this as your 3D movie theater screen or your 3D TV screen. And I have my eye in two positions and they're looking at this screen and they have off axis thrust them from the two different eyes in a separate different way. So there are some specialized cases where you want to go set this up in a more generalized way. You don't need to do it in your assignments. We're not doing any of these things, but I wanted you to be aware that the commands are there to set up a more general matrix in order to do this operation.